Meet Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect forever linked to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This tale has captivated hearts for over 2,000 years. But here's the mystery. We know so little about Pilate himself and what came next in his life. Early writings by folks like Josephus, Eusebius, and other ancient Christian historians give us a peek into his later years. They help us answer the intriguing question, what really happened to Pontius Pilate after those fateful days? We don't have much information about the early life of this regular Roman official. However, according to some traditional stories, he was part of the Roman equestrian class and came from the Ponti clan in Italy, which explains his name, Pontius. But apart from that, not much is known about where he was born, his origins, or his early years, until he took up the role that made him famous. In 26 AD, Pilate stepped into the shoes of the fifth governor of the Roman province of Judea. He landed this position thanks to his connections with Sejanus, a highly influential figure during the time of the second Roman emperor Tiberius. Pilate took charge in Judea only 20 years after King Herod Archelaus had been removed, shifting the region into direct Roman governance. This period was marked by tension, particularly because the Jewish people, who stood out among Rome's subjects for their belief in one God rather than many, were in a state of rebellion. Within the Jewish population, various groups were increasingly drawn to self-proclaimed messiahs who preached across the province in the first century AD. In the midst of Pilate's time as governor, a man we now recognize as Jesus was just one of these messiah figures active in the area. Pilate governed Roman Judea for 10 years from 26 AD to 36 AD. The exact timing of Jesus being brought before him and condemned by Jewish leaders isn't definitively known. However, there's a theory that this event occurred in 33 AD. In 31 AD, Sejanus was removed from power and executed. This had a ripple effect on Pilate's authority in Judea, as he no longer had the backing he once did. Pilate's choice to satisfy the demands of Jewish leaders and comply with their requests could have been influenced by his weakened position. This idea gains traction because during the time between his appointment in 26 AD and Sejanus's execution in the autumn of 31 AD, Pilate had generally maintained an adversarial stance toward the Jewish leaders in the province. His actions, like minting coins adorned with symbols of pagan gods and displaying Emperor Tiberius's images in Jerusalem and other towns across the province, had stirred the ire of the Jewish people who viewed these acts as idolatrous. Given this backdrop, it's reasonable to surmise that Pilate's shift towards a more conciliatory approach, granting the leader's plea for Jesus' crucifixion, unfolded during a period when his authority as governor of Judea was precarious, following Sejanus' fall from power. In contrast to the often dramatic portrayal of Pilate's decision to condemn Jesus in the New Testament, it's quite plausible that this was an ordinary occurrence in his role as governor. His decision likely aimed at preventing disturbances during Passover by accommodating the request of the Jewish leaders. Jesus' crucifixion did not earn him any ill will from Rome, and he continued successfully ruling the region for years afterward. Around 36 AD, a group of Samaritans from Samaria who followed a different messiah, perhaps named Dositheos, started digging on Mount Gerizim. They believed they'd unearth valuable artifacts connected to the Hebrew prophet Moses. In response, Pilate instructed some of his soldiers to head to Mount Gerizim, resulting in a tragic massacre of the Samaritans. Following this, a complaint reached the governor of the neighboring Roman province of Syria, Lucius Vitellius. He treated this matter seriously enough to send a report to Rome. This led to Pilate being summoned back to the Eternal City by Emperor Tiberius to answer for his actions as the governor. When Pilate finally reached Rome in 37 AD, Tiberius had already passed away, and Emperor Caligula had taken his place. It was a common pattern for individuals in Pilate's position, facing severe accusations, to be pardoned when a new emperor came into power. This historical trend makes it unclear what ultimately happened to Pilate. Interestingly, Pilate's presence in historical records largely dwindles, giving rise to two competing theories. 
However, neither of these theories has substantial evidence to definitively establish their accuracy. The first theory proposes that Pilate fell out of favor due to his conduct as governor of Judea and potentially ended his own life shortly after returning to Rome. On the flip side, another viewpoint suggests that Caligula extended forgiveness, and Pilate retired to a tranquil and modest life on an Italian countryside estate. His existence remained in relative obscurity until the authors of the New Testament began penning their accounts of Jesus' life several decades later. Whichever of these two scenarios sheds light on Pontius Pilate's later years, it's clear that his reputation today is a blend of perspectives. In some strands of Christian belief, he's seen as a hesitant governor who reluctantly gave the green light to Jesus' crucifixion in order to pacify the temple leaders in Jerusalem. The Christian Ethiopian Church and the Coptic Church of Egypt honor Pilate as a saint. On the flip side, many others tend to see him as a harsh and brutal governor, with his role in the death of the Son of God positioning him as a notable antagonist in Roman history. Deciding which of these viewpoints is more accurate is perhaps as tricky as figuring out whether he ended his life in 37 AD or spent his later years in peaceful retirement. So the question remains, how should we remember Pontius Pilate today?